Okay, here we are again. Um, we have uh, our next guest. It's uh, um, for Giuseppe Cortese. Uh, so we stay in Piemonte after Ricardo, and we move it to our next guest in the heart of Barbaresco, in the hill of Rabaya. Um, we have Gabriele Occhetti to represent the family. Buongiorno, Gabriele. Buonasera. Buongiorno. Buon pomeriggio. Buongiorno to everyone. So, um, um, before Gabriele starts, once again, uh, we see for people that just join now, uh, if you have questions for Gabriele, please use the Q&E option, and uh, all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Gabriele, all yours. Good. So welcome to everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to talk with a lot of people from Wynmo, even if we are not in direct contact, uh, seeing other personally, like in Verona, but it would be, uh, I think, uh, and I hope, uh, nice uh, um, too. So a um, few words about me, first of all. I'm Gabriele, as I say, Giovanni, I'm part of the third generation of uh, the family of Giuseppe Cortese in Barbaresco. Uh, I married, in fact, the doctor of Giuseppe. So now the, the, the winery is managed by me, my wife and my brother-in-law. Uh, so Piercaro is uh, officially the owner and the, the technical part, technical side. So he's the winemaker technically. And me, I take care more of the commercial side. And my wife manage more uh, bread and breakfast. Uh, so uh, a few words about uh, Giuseppe Cortese. Uh, I think that's uh, many of you that have uh, an history uh, working with, uh, with wine, but know that uh, Giuseppe Cortese is one of the most historical label in uh, Leonardo Locascio selection. We started working with Leonardo Locascio in uh, 1985, so almost at the beginning of the, the career of Leonardo Locascio, and we never moved from one mode, and this is very, very important matter. So we always uh, uh, had a good feeling with the one mode team, and we grew together. Um, what it means that when Giuseppe started, uh, the estate was very, very small. You have to imagine that uh, family of Giuseppe born in Baia Hill, uh, but at the beginning they own a very, very small plot. And we are talking about the 50s, the 60s, so when uh, uh, the richness in this area were not uh, for sure like today. Um, Giuseppe started in 1971, and it is the first important concept uh, working and remembering about our winery to keep on mind. 1971, a vintage in uh, in the Langhe area, and the first vintage that Giuseppe decides uh, to produce uh, Barbaresco uh, themselves and putting the label of Barbaresco on a label, on a bottle. So first official uh, vintage, 1971. Second important concept, Rabbi Yahil. So I think as you know, that Barbaresco is a very, very small area that includes simply three villages, Barbaresco, Trace, and Neve, small part of Alba for sure. Um, well organized in single vineyard, similar to Burgund a little bit. So some of them, uh, let me say, are a little bit less important, more convention. Some of them have an history. So the Rabaya probably is uh, the most famous one. Uh, people started writing Rabaya on a label of Barbaresco in the 60s. And when uh, Giuseppe do it for the first time in 1971, he said it was a kind of pioneer. Uh, so what it means that today we represent the most important single vineyard in Barbaresco and we are the largest producer inside this single vineyard and this is very very important. Uh, another important concept uh, talking about our winery uh, it's a little bit our style of production. Uh, since the beginning our style of production is oriented on the, on the terroir. What it means uh, we always produce wine uh, with the idea of, uh, of the terroir. So to show to people the identity of the single vineyard of the Nebbiolo grape. So we never uh, make experiments trying to have something different in flavors in the approach, but it's a mission. So the Barbaresco must reflect the unicity and the identity of the combination between the soil microclima, and for sure the Nepure grape. So this is a little bit just for introducing to you better uh, this state. 
uh, in terms of the area, uh, I already said it's okay. We talk about Barbaresco in the middle of Langer is uh, more or less one third of Barolo, just also to compare it with the size. Um, the average in altitude is more or less 270 uh, uh, meters uh, uh, on level of sea. Uh, the soil is a little bit a mix of clay, clay and limestone. Uh, not so far away from the soil that you can find in uh, but the most important things compared with Barolo in the average it's a little bit uh, less hard soil uh, that's the transfer in the wine in the average a little bit more finesse and elegance and this is the important key elements when people talk about Barbaresco you know for us it's important that today Barbaresco has a strong reputation Today is no more interesting to talk about that Barbaresco is uh, the queen uh, close to the king, Barolo is no more the younger brother. It's a different option talking about Nebbiolo high quality. And this is very, very important, you know? So stop to consider Barbaresco something less than Barolo. Barbaresco is a Nebbiolo that have a similar potential, similar value than Barolo. It's important today for me to uh, choose and to follow which one is your favorite taste, your favorite approach, your favorite single vineyard, both in Barolo and in Barbaresco, in the same way that people approach Burgundy in the average. So that is a little bit just for uh, talk about the estate, to talk about the winery. Um, I was talking before with Giovanni that um, um, was preparing a kind of uh, virtual tour in the winery, uh, including what you can see outside from the window, but unfortunately it's a really rainy day, so not so nice. Let me see. Well, you see all white. It's not so interesting. Uh, I will take a few minutes before talking about the wines for showing to you a little bit something uh, in the winery. Maybe some, some one of you already stayed here. By the way, it's so small winery that it can be interesting. Well, first important things, you can say hello to maybe, we are lucky, no, Pierre Cali is not here. So, um, this is labeling machine. Guys, we, to, tomorrow we start to, to label your Nebbiolo, Dolcetto and Barbera. Bravo, Gabriele. So. Thank you. <laughs> this is that. important. Yes, very important. <laughs> label, put well, that machine yeah. on. Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now today we are preparing cartons. So, uh, important steps. What you see here, some Slavonian oak. This, I try to, yeah. So this is one of the three that we use for our reserva of Rabaya. Here inside, we still have 16. In, on January, we started to sell the 13. And this is uh, already available for wine boat team. And this is our most important uh, wine label. Just produce only sometimes. If you have a look here, These are the labels still naked for wine bowl, for the labeling coming soon. Next step, very, very quickly. Just here you can see many casks. This is the main storage room. You can have a little bit of an idea. Mostly we work with Slavonian oak. You can see that we have some amphora we use for white. We use uh, still some barriques for a version of Barbera, but mostly the approach of the winery, as I said before, is very, very traditional. And this is very, very important. You know, today, Giovanni know very, very well, it's uh, no more the time when people have a fight between traditional and modern style. Important is that the wine is good. Uh, but so let me say, if today uh, the higher reputation looks to have a traditional approach, we can say that today we have traditional approach and uh, we never stop to have it. This is very important. People can find uh, and can try some Barbaresco from Giuseppe Cortese from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. 
you always find the same approach. That's very, very important because it's a, it's a kind of, um, let me say, reputation build. Well, I saw Giovanni, maybe that you see also a message from the chat asking about the Hanfore. Eh? Well, yes. Uh, in, the, in the Amphora, we hedge our white. It's a wine that we never export to, 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 um, to US. It's a small production. Uh, it's a Chardonnay basis. So we never find it was uh, so interesting to talk about the Chardonnay in US. But it's a wine very, very interesting that we are starting to, to sell very, very, very worldwide for a simple reason. Um, it's a wine produced in spontaneous fermentation and aging apart in, in, uh, in clay. That gives something that is not so similar to a, an international Chardonnay, more a local white. So maybe you will have the opportunity to try it in the future. I really hope so. Um, talking about in general, about uh, the wine that I want to show to you, um, the six label that uh, we export to wine bowl are the six that you see on my back. We have uh, the three Barbarescos, Barbaresco Rabaya Reserva. This is our most important label. That's the one that we release only in the most important vintages. And now we have a new one, 2013. After we have our famous Rabaya, for the Rabaya, I still show to you a label of 2016, the one that is already in US, because the new one 17 is not yet, not yet labeled. It will be prepared for September. So we have all the time. Um, very, very important for me is to show the third one is this one, the blue one. That one is the new entry of the family of Giuseppe Cortese wine. That's the classical Barbaresco. And after I should, uh, we'll explain to you better what, what we are talking about. But important is a new label. It's a, an alternative to the Rabaya, a little bit, let me say, less ambitious, uh, ready uh, at the beginning of the year on the market. And this is a very, very new commercial opportunity. After we have other three very, very classical vintage, uh, sorry, labels, that's have the Lange Nebbiolo, as usual, producing a large cask and a kind of younger brother of a Barbaresco. New vintage is 18. And the new releasing of Dolcetto and Barbera, the classical one, 19. So Barbera, Lange Dolcetto and Lange Nebbiolo are the one that we are starting to label for wine boat starting from tomorrow. Um, well, I think that I have to move a little bit on the explanation on the wine, considering that's uh, mostly the grape that we, are, we work are the classical one in Lange. So Dolcetto, Barbera, and Nebbiolo for the Barbarescos, for sure. Uh, let me talk, uh, let me start from the Rabaia Reserva. We start with the, from the most important one. Uh, Rabaia Reserva, uh, as I explained to you before, it's a selection coming from the Rabaia that we don't produce every year. What it means for us producing a reserve is to say, okay, uh, I want to show the maximum potential quality coming from the single vineyard. Um, we have the grape, we have the single vineyard, but uh, the, uh, let me say the weather can be different every year. So not every year we can reach the maximum top quality. Uh, in 2013, we had it. So what it happens when we have this condition, we pick up separately the grape, the bunches from the older side of the Rapaya. It's a vineyard more or less 70 years old. So separate pickup, separate vinification in the large concrete old tanks, and after a long patent aging. This wine aged for 40 months in the free cast that I showed to you before. After this time, other three years in the bottle. That means that we release the wine on the seventh year after the harvest. That's why we just started to sell now 2013. 
2013 was the one that uh, I already show in New Year's City at the, the BBWO in February. It's the one that uh, is uh, since uh, 2017 that Antonio Galloni come here to try at uh, the beginning from the cask. Uh, and let me say we have, um, um, well, I think it is an important one. On a pre-testing, we already have uh, uh, something like 95 plus from Antonio and high expectation. Is the, that's the previous edition, 2011, was the one that um, um, last year we received a phone call. Um, was my, in my mother-in-law say, oh, it's something from US maybe. Uh, it was Bruce Anderson says, asking to us, what do you do with the Eurozero 11? Say nothing. It's the same wine since 96. But he say, oh, it's an unbelievable wine. I, want, I trust on this wine. I want to follow the uh, following edition. So I think that's together with what we trust on our wine. Also the reputation of this label is very, very important when we talk about opinion leader, leaders. Um, after we move on the Rabaya, this is our classical brown label of the Rabaya. Rabaya, um, usually, till last year, we were released um, more or less um, March to May. Start from this year, as we have the classical Barbaresco available on the market, we will start to sell it only in September. Uh, what it means that we want that wine age a little bit longer in the bottle for reaching really, really the maximum potential. So for the Rabaya 17, we have to wait September. Um, the classical Barbaresco, the new label that I sent you before. This, this one, it's already shipped to Livorno for uh, one more team. Um, so, a few words about this new label. Uh, a lot of people has, has to ask why you release as a new label something not so ambitious like another crew, uh, or you work uh, and your decision was to move on a classical Barbaresco. Um, the reason is simple. In this case, we the idea was not to have a wine for a uh, grow our reputation, but so for offer a good commercial opportunity to our partners. So in a time where our Rabaya is growing a lot in terms of reputation, and at the same time also of, uh, on uh, a price positioning, it's important to offer to our partners an alternative. So in the classical Barbaresco, you have a Barbaresco produced by Giuseppe Cortese. You have more or less the same approach simply a little bit less aging in oak, simply a little bit less aging in the bottle, a little bit less ambitious in terms of potential of aging, but the same approach, the same touch of Giuseppe Cortese, and very, very important, less expensive. So something that is more easier to approach on some kind of customers that maybe need something also by the glass, something a little bit easier, but at the same time with the reputation of Giuseppe Cortese. And that helps also the work uh, of uh, growing in position if, of the Rabaya and Rabaya Reserva for sure. So people have to understand that Giuseppe Cortese now is not simply Rabaya in terms of Barbaresco. Rabaya for people that need Rabaya, that accept the new positioning, and that one can be something more of good opportunity in terms of commercial speaking. Uh, after, uh, let me say, uh, we can jump a little bit on the Lange Nebbiolo. Uh, it's, a, it's this classical Nebbiolo that we produce every year. It's important one uh, thing that I, I forgot to say. When we talk about the quality of the classical Barbaresco, uh, you have to understand how we produce the Barbaresco. I talk about less aging in oak and less time in, in the bottle. Uh, sure, but important things. The 90% of bunches here come from the Rabaya. What it happens? We plant some vineyard of Nebbiolo in Trifolera land, just in face of the Rabaya. So there, now, we can produce the Lange Nebbiolo with the same aging of one year in large cask like always. But before the Nebbiolo were declassification of some plot in, um, from the Rabaya. It was a pity commercially speaking. 
So now for the Nebbiolo, we have a single vineyard, Trifolera, less ambitious, very, very good for this label. And with the plot, with the parcels of uh, Rabaya that every year on our judgment are a little bit less, mm, let me say not enough for making a Grand Cru, we produce that one. So that's why here you can find always a good quality. We are not looking to say, make something different than what we are used to do. Uh, Giovanni, no, our grape grows simple, simple in two vineyards. The Nebbiolo, basically in the Rabaya, and in Trifolera, the Dolcetto and the Barbera. Now in Trifolera, we enlarge a little bit. So there we have Nebbiolo for the Lange Nebbiolo. We have a little bit more space of Nebbiolo grape for making the classical one here. But nothing changed in terms of people. It's reminded that Giuseppe Cortese works simply in these two single vineyards. It's still the same. So nothing changed in this direction. And after our other uh, two labels, that's our, our classical, um, Barbera d'Alba, 19, and Dolcetto Lange, 19. So a few words about uh, uh, Barbera is, uh, as usually, very, very venous, very, very, very classical, transversal, easy uh, to sell, easy to drink. And a few words more about Dolcetto. Starting from last year, we moved the denomination from Dolcetto d'Alba of Lange Dolcetto. Um, someone asked why uh, we don't have a real, uh, let me say, it's not a matter in terms of production or something like this, it's simply a little bit a commercial idea. Uh, today, we know that Dolcetto sometimes can be not so easy to explain, not a big reputation everywhere. Putting Dolcetto under the hat of a Lange denomination is a little bit easier to explain. So this is a Lange wine made with Dolcetto grape. As usual, very, very nice, very, very flavor crunchy, easy to approach. People can drink it chilly, so very, very transversal. Um, one thing for me very, very important, coming back a little bit on the Barbaresco 17s. Um, 17s come after 16. 16 has a crazy high reputation in terms of wine made in this region. Barbaresco last year, and I suppose, I know, uh, high reputation of Barolo this year. Someone talk uh, about uh, 17 so so. Uh, let me say no. This is a wrong, definitely a wrong message. 17 is a little bit less than 16 in terms of deepness, in terms of ambitious to have something really crazy uh, value for long, long keeping. But it's not, definitely not a hot vintage. Someone is say it's a hot vintage. No, hotter than 16. It means a wines a little bit more open, uh, a little bit more fruity, a little bit more uh, uh, with higher richness, but the acidity uh, are very, very good. And the structure of the wine is very, very serious. So you will see approaching 17, if someone say, oh, uh, it's less than, seven, than 16, say, no, it's different. It's uh, something more uh, oriented to a consumption on a, uh, mid midterm, maybe. Maybe a little bit less interesting for, uh, let me say, crazy collectors uh, following only something, but it's a wonderful wine. And especially for restaurants, uh, on, for people that uh, have the idea, not necessarily to long storage, it will be a wonderful one. You will see. Maybe some journalists will make more uh, critic on 17. They have to do because it's their work. <laughs> you know very well. Um, let me say another thing very, very quickly. I prepared two glasses. I know this is um, it's difficult from you to see a little bit. But yeah, you're making us a little jealous, uh, Gabriele. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a simple example just for, uh, for the colors. This I want to say. I know this from you, it's, impossible, it's difficult to say. But if you see the two glasses, you don't see only two different shapes of glasses, but you see two different wines. If you see something darker, more venous, like the one that I have here, we talk about a Barbera when a Barbera have to play the game of something that's uh, 
reflects the idea of a powerful and rich wine starting from the color. If you see on these bottles, the Nebbiolo for Barbaresco, you see something different. Classy, more brilliant, more light. That is a pure Nebbiolo. Don't forget, on a pure Nebbiolo, maybe sometimes you have a little bit lighter color, sometimes you have a little bit of darker color, but you don't have to move from this kind of color, ruby. Not for sure purple on something like this. Well, I don't want to make something that you become really jealous trying the wines. It's not necessary. <laughs> but it's, it was nice for me just uh, to give to you the idea, you know. When you talk about Barbaresco and Nebbiolo, especially for us that are very, very oriented on this kind of approach, color is very, very, very important. Well, I don't know how I move on my timing. Uh, you're doing fantastic, Gabriele. Thank you very much for uh, you know your uh, your good timing, your good English. You came really well prepared. You took in us into your vineyard. Uh, so we have time, so you can go on if you want, or we can uh, go to the question and answer uh, situation. Oh, let me say. Let, let me consider if I have something to add. Um, well, let me say I can be open to to questions. So maybe answer to some of them. Uh, we have a more uh, a matter to discuss about it. Okay, the first question, I want to ask it myself. And um, Please. <laughs> it is this way. Why did it take you so long to release um, a DOCG Barbaresco? Not the crew, not the rabbi, yeah, because we're so happy that uh, you guys are doing this wine that uh, I was just wondering, why not before? <laughs> sure, yeah, this is a good question. Basically, for two reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, it's uh, the price positioning. So historically, producing only one Barbaresco and people that work long time with our um, wines know that we had always an interesting price point. So historically, our Barbaresco Rabaya was a little bit um, uh, not enough expensive to have the space for putting down a basic Barbaresco. Mm. So with the work that we do in the last year was to grow in the price of Rabaya for having on the market the correct positioning for a classic Barbaresco. And the second important thing, as people know, we are farmers. So we had to be prepared also to have our own vineyard for making the wine. So uh, we need some years for buying a new plot in Trifolera, for preparing good Nebbiolo vineyard there, for help waiting uh, three, four years before the grape uh, reach big production to say, okay, now this vineyard is ready. We can move the production of Nebbiolo there and we can use the classification of Rabaya for making something more. So the two things together, good, pro good positioning of Rabaya and at the same time to have the raw material. So to have new vineyard for making both wine, because it's very, very important. Someone asked to me, okay, now you have uh, our uh, classical Barbaresco, so you will miss care on the Nebbiolo. No, definitely. People used to consider our Lange Nebbiolo as a baby Barbaresco, you still have the same product. And that's why, you know, price position is very, very important. It's an opportunity more. It doesn't mean that the new Barbaresco have uh, to be a uh, substitute of the Nebbiolo or substitute of the Rabaya. It's something more. We see it has uh, something that can help people use to buy simply Nebbiolo to reach a higher level of Giuseppe Cortese and at the same time, it's an opportunity to people working only with the Rabaya to approach also for Giuseppe Cortella something a little bit less expensive. So it's a point of connection that's uh, it's very, very important in this, in this direction. Beautiful. Uh, the next question is from Austin. And uh, I'm reading to you, the wines from Cortese across the whole line have a notably vibrant acidity and elegance that gives them a lot of aromatics and lift on the palate. It looks like a review of your wine, bravo, Stino. 
uh, they always seem so fresh. What does Cortese do differently from other producers in the area to make this kind of house style possible? Oh, wow. So what is Good the guy. secret <laughs> recipe of Cortese? No, it's, um, let me say, it's, um, I understand that and I, I, I agree. For us, the, the, the freshness, it's a key element for the long keeping. And the one from this region must be, uh, on, on the beginning, they are born for the idea of, of a good keeping. And we follow and we trust in this direction. What it means, that's approaching the vinification in a very, very classical and traditional way, you put attention uh, naturally on the acidity. What it means, sometimes when you don't have enough acidity, you have the wine that are manipulated not to have a lot of acidity. So with a kind of work uh, in terms of concentration, in terms of uh, uh, have a little bit of too ripening sometimes, in terms to have um, too uh, reduction, too, too aggressive green harvest in, in the vineyard, considering that the reduction of acidity usually is connected with the darker color and with more uh, sweet flavors. So simply, if we don't consider acidity something uh, uh, to be scared about it, don't forget what it happens in the 90s, where the wave of more modern, say, okay, darker, sweeter, less tannin and less acidity. Uh, so now we say, okay, uh, we never move from this idea and we follow to this idea. Simply now people put attention on acidity the same one 10 years ago, maybe someone say, oh, it can be a problem. Now it's a good, it's a good key element. Uh, trust me, with our weather, uh, with uh, our grape, for sure, the Nebbiolo, it helps a lot. But the same Barbera, if you manage uh, the ripening in a good way and the vinification in a very, very soft and traditional way, you keep high acidity every, every time. And even in a little bit more warmer vintage. So when people, when, when before, sorry, I talk about the value of 17, you will see a 17 with good acidity. Simply, we had a little bit more bunches, we wait a correct time for the ripening, and we have soft vinification. And after the Nebbiolo, express a lot of acidity, generally. Okay, thank you, Gabriele. We have um, another few questions Welcome. that came through the chat. Um, one is from Dali, and he wants to know if you guys make any other uh, white wines besides Chardonnay. No, no. Historically, uh, well, we started producing Chardonnay in the 90s, so uh, when almost everyone in Lange started with the white, and you know, the origin of planting white, Gaia and, and others from the first, was basically um american market what it means that um, the reputation of wineries here will start to grow and to be important but a lot of um, important people from the us say okay but you don't have a white and don't you don't work with an international grape so if people don't need an international variety on red uh, we had a lack on white uh, so a lot of people started with Chardonnay, Chardonnay, some one Sauvignon, today recently some one moved to Riesling, but 90% of the white in Lange is Chardonnay. Uh, why Chardonnay? Also because Arnais is in the Roero and tried to have Arnais here when our neighbor in Roero can be better, it was not so interesting. So Chardonnay and also Giuseppe Cortese in a small plot, it's more or less one hectare, we start with Chardonnay. Since the beginning, uh, let me say in a double option few bottles of a classical, more traditional sample, simply stainless steel, and one more oak. Three years ago, we moved in only one Chardonnay, and this is a mix of a part in stainless, a part in clay, and a part in barrique. And most important things is uh, we stopped to name it Chardonnay. Now the wine is simply Lange Bianco, white. Because we don't like want that. the people, yeah, people don't, if, if you approach this label considering what you know about Chardonnay, maybe you have misunderstanding. This is a Lange Bianco, because inside you feel the terroir, you feel the acidity, the saltiness of uh, our soil and our approach. 
Um, it happens, this is interesting to, to say to you, uh, you know, before the, the, the virus, we often we have uh, visitors from US. It's, uh, uh, I think, October last year, some uh, private consumer, consumer coming from US arriving here, uh, classical couple mid-age, the, the man oriented on red, the woman say, oh, you have a white, you have a Chardonnay. I love Chardonnay. Uh, that's uh, my pool party wine in summertime. Trying the Chardonnay, say, ah. <laughs> okay, say, and, and she has to me why I don't find pineapple in this Chardonnay. And I simply say, sorry, I have to explain to you before better about the wine. But if you want, if you open my window, outside you don't see pineapple. If you find pineapple on a Chardonnay produced in this area, is why? It's because someone wants to show to you something safe. It's something that's like, I, I name something like a Coke approach, you know? If you love this, this taste, you feel nice with this taste and everyone try to offer a safe taste. It's good, well done, for sure. But if you are a small producer, historical like we are, producing 7,000 bottles of fresh a white, it's more interesting to show something unique than something safe. That's why. Yeah, you can keep a little bottle of pineapple juice just in case. <laughs> you know? And maybe, if somebody maybe. wants, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can do so. Um, so, our friend Tony Morello uh, her, has heard rumors of reverting to the old label of Rabaya. The one with the picture of the vineyard is that true or um, sorry, just a rumor? sorry i didn't um, understand tony heard the rumor that you guys are going back to the old label when uh, when you have the winery on the label is that true are you wow. planning to change your label uh, because you have spies <laughs> no. in, uh, in Rabaya? No. no tony you need to change no, your spy. No. no you say that we want to change again our our label Yes, revert into the, the old no, label no, with the photo probably, of the No, probably, but it's uh, still uh, something that we don't know. We are considering a kind of a special edition celebrating our 50 years uh, using, uh, for a special edition, maybe the first label of Giuseppe Cortese, but it's, uh, we don't want to change uh, at the moment. So let me show to you, so if we talk about it, Sorry, I was killing my mother-in-law. So, no, please don't. So, <laughs> well, that's the one that you see here. That has been our first label. Oh, wow. The Barbaresco 71 was labeled with this kind of label. Let me say it was a kind of universal label. Uh, yeah. Something that uh, uh, you, you were, people were buying it. Uh, and writing, it's me, this is the Halkel, no more. Maybe we, we think something about this. Um, maybe Tony was talking about that one. Is that this the is one, the, Tony? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Cento. That one Cento. was the one that uh, we started. In fact, uh, uh, I think um, beginning of eighties till uh, ninety-seven was more or less that one. After we we move, we change, uh, but we don't have provision to change again. But maybe maybe something uh, coming just for a special edition. Beautiful. Thank you, Gabriele. We have another um, interesting question from Scott Hudson, and he wants to know if there is a comparable personality in the wines of Rabaya cross producer. In other words, is there a Rabaya style or every producer interpret oh, well, Rabaya very, very nice question. Uh, the wrong way? Okay, uh, let me say we don't have a Rabaya style, but we have a Rabaya reputation. Rabaya reputation means that. Uh, Everyone in Rabaya is a nice producer. It's a producer with a good hand and high knowledge on how to make good wine. Um, and every Rabaya has a high, high quality. Uh, let me say, if you want to, to, to have a kind of um, point in common, 
if everyone show a very, very classical uh, approach, um, it's uh, something a little bit more um, um, orange notes than other single vineyard in, in Barbaresco. If you compare my Rabaya with other single vineyard everywhere. Um, so for sure, uh, as you say, no, it's uh, to find a very, very uh, same approach, no, but as I say, all, everyone are very, very high quality. And maybe that uh, to have also producer that show a little bit more uh, modern interpretation, but with a crazy high reputation and um, they know very, very, very well how to make good wine. It's also an opportunity. It's an opportunity to have a little bit uh, uh, more option more option to have a different uh, approach of a single uh, vineyard. Thank you, Gabriele. Uh, let me see. Welcome. Okay, I have uh, one last question for you. Um, when I started, um, I know you and I talk about this, but I would love for you to reiterate um, with our friends. Uh, when I started selling your wines uh, 20 years ago, your dolcetto was called Trifolera. Now, we know that yeah. Trifolera is a crew of Barbaresco. So for, yeah. me, uh, for me, making a dolcetto named Trifolera was as luxurious as putting a tuxedo on to go shop for groceries. So basically, you were using a dedicated crew of Barbaresco to produce your simple dolcetto. Um, do you want to explain how, was that just because oh, that's the land you have? You didn't have generic land, just uh, extraordinary yeah, crews uh, or... Uh, that's what was a, the reason why it's like somebody makes wow. a dolcetto in Rabaya? I don't think anybody does, but you guys are capable of no. everything. <laughs> no, it's but Trifolera is right next to it. I mean, it's an important crew in in Barbaresco, not as important as Rabaya, but well, let me say, um, that's we have to come back just to on to say on our on our history. The winery started in the, in, in the Rabaya with the Nebbiolo. And the hill just in face is the Trifolera. And so when Giuseppe decide to have a little bit more land, the, the easier selection, solution, especially for a farmers like we are, was to buy land close to the house, close to Rabaya. So we move in Trifolera. In Trifolera, the first buying were on a small plot uh, that historically had the name Morassina. And there we had some Barbera. So we decided to name it a kind of Barbera, the Barbera in, in Oak with this name. After we had another land of, um, of Barbera, a little bit more down, and we say, okay, we have already a Barbera, Morassina with a, a name, classical Barbera will be simple Barbera. And after we had Dolcetto, and we say for the Dolcetto, we would like to have something of uh, a name, something like this. So we use the name of the area. Trifolera. Uh, what it happens after this is Trifolera become a, an official name on the MGA. So people say, okay, stop to use on a dolcetto because you have to use only on Barbaresco. Um, okay, we stop it. And at the same time, we decide not to use a fantasy name, something new. Uh, so we, we explain that the crepe come always from the same, from the same area always in, Tripol in Trifolera, simply you are no more allowed to name it Trifolera. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have to understand that in fact, if, even if it's an official name of single vineyard, the Trifolera is not a crazy reputation. Uh, vineyard there, especially for the Nebbiolo, are in the average very, very young. Only a small part of Trifolera looked south exposure. So the reputation of Trifolera, it's very, very good if you want to make white and our should rise from there. If you have to have, a, want to have a light, elegant, classical dolcetto like we produce, and why not for uh, Nebbiolo, for Lange Nebbiolo? On the Lange Nebbiolo, you need less structure and a little bit more attention and elegance and, and finesse. So that's the mission uh, of, um, of this area. So say that's, that's the reason of why. Historically, Trifolera was easy for us, grape up there, and when we finish, it's pretty finished. Thank you, Gabriele. Uh, do we have any other question for our um, friend from the Lange? 
I don't see anything. So, uh, Gabriele, we say goodbye to you. Thank you, thank you super very much. Uh, you were very informative. You really took us uh, into your house here, into your home. <laughs> uh, we just missed Irene, but that is something <laughs> hardly comes on Zoom. Time. And, uh, the and is not cake. Like I always say during <laughs> sure. the presentation on this, when we're presenting our first, um, and I always say, and hopefully last, in Italy online, because we want to be there in Verona next year. We want to be with you. Uh, we want to taste those fantastic wines. Sure, uh, thank sure. you, Gabriele. Arrivederci. For My everybody pleasure. else, uh, we're going to reconnect at um, 11.30. Uh, Stefano Maggini, our next host, is already here. Uh, just in case you guys need a quick break, uh, we'll be back in five minutes. Thank you.